Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray with Let's Make Art and I teach watercolor tutorials, a new one every week. And this week we are doing the otter. I was about to say sea otter, but that is a different animal. It is there, very different. <laughs> um, I have Keenan here, he's filming. He'll tell me where to look and if my head is in the way of any cameras. Yes, hello. We have Aaron also who's with us and um, we are using the following supplies. So we're going to use a round six and a round two. This is our Let's Make Art Classic Series um, Synthetic Care Great Brushes. We've named them. You don't have to name your paintbrushes. <laughs> Keenan, did you know that this is you? I did know that. <laughs> I found out recently. And this is Brock. <laughs> <laughs> Very fitting. <laughs> um, they're round six, round two. I have noticed that sizing of brushes is not the same all across the board, so don't stress out if you have a different brand and they're slightly different sizes. I don't know why they do that. It's like jeans. You know what I mean? Jeans. Yes, jeans. Women's jeans, at least. I don't know about men's jeans. I don't know if I buy enough jeans. To know if the sizing is different across? Yeah, I wait as long as humanly possible <laughs> to buy a new pair of jeans. <laughs> Okay, we are going to do this project in five steps. So our very first step, we are going to put in our shadows and start defining our spaces. Our second step, we are going to start putting in our fur shadows here, kind of where the fur is gathering on our otter. Our third step, we are going to paint the water around here. Um, fourth step, we are going to do the face, so the eyes, nose, and mouth. And the last step um, I like to use as details. So just take a step back from your painting, see what else it needs. We are using four colors. So our first color here is tiger orange. Our second color is rose red. Our third color is leaf green. And our fourth color is azure blue. The different techniques and warm-ups we'll do in this tutorial is nothing different than what we usually do. Um, so we're going to look at values. We're going to do some thin lines for the detailing. If you're not familiar with it, what, with what those are, you can watch our beginner series where I go over those. And frankly, we kind of use those same techniques in every painting that we do. Um, so it is a good idea to familiarize yourself with those terms um, as we start to paint. Okay, so I'm going to do the outline. I'm going to trace the outline and then we'll do our oath and then we'll start painting. Perfect. So with our outline here, if you have the kit or the subscription, it comes with it. If not, you can download this outline for free on our website. You do have to go through the checkout process, but you don't actually have to pay any money. Okay, but you do have to add it to your cart. That's how we keep track of how many outlines. Of your every move. <laughs> That's how we know. Big Brother is what you can refer to us now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have my outline here. I'm going to line the right side up with the right edge of my paper. You can even, if you want that end of the body to line up with the edge of your paper. And then I tape it down so then when I'm tracing, I don't lose my spot. And then you're going to take your graphite paper um, and you're going to use the darker, shiny side down. And just so you guys know, as you can tell, this is a well-used piece of graphite paper, well-loved. Um, they're reusable and they actually get better with age because then they're not as sensitive. The first couple of times you use graphite paper, you're going to notice that like even your like wrist resting is going to leave some marks, maybe even the creases is going to leave some marks. That's normal. Just keep using it a lot and it will get better. I actually like that look when something's left behind by the graphite paper. Yeah, it's kind of like it this cool. cool. Yeah, I think it's cool. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Okay. So I put it in between my outline and the paper, and then I'm going to take, you can use a pencil, you can use a pen. If you have a hard time getting a soft line when you do the outline, I would suggest using a felt tip marker because it's a softer point, so then the line is going to be as light. Um, this is just a pen. And then I'm going to trace a line and then pick up and see how dark it leaves on my paper and then I'll adjust. If I want it lighter, I'll do lighter pressure like that so you can see the difference. Or if I want it darker, I would press harder. For those of you at home, I would suggest trying to do as light 
of pressure as possible because watercolor is transparent. So these lines you're going to most likely see through your paint if they're really dark. Now I try and go a little bit darker um, when I'm making these videos so you guys can actually see what I'm doing. Um, but just do what you feel comfortable doing. Also, the, uh, sorry, I was like thinking of tracing. Um, the other thing to think about is even if your outline is really too dark, <clears throat> we give you two sheets of paper per project. You can always do it again. I don't want you to um, stress and think that you've totally messed up because your outline is too dark. Like it's just a piece of paper. The worst thing is you'll just like put it away or throw it away, but we give you another one. So not a big deal. Also, if you look at that in the future and see your progress from that one versus the most recent one, you'll probably have improved. That is very true. And it's a good, uh, it's a good milestone for you. And actually, we sell these. Um, this paper that we're using is the Canson 140-pound um, XL. Yes. XL. It's the same paper we've been using for the that entire is, time. That is true. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> um, I would suggest just adding a pad of this to your order because then you have all of the paper you need to do as many projects as you want. So We were actually doing an art hour, Monday fun day art hour thing for, for uh, work. Well, now we do it regularly, but I did many projects. And an easy way to do that would be get a full sheet of paper and then cut it into Oh, quarters. many like small. Yeah. I thought you were saying many like a lot. Many. Oh, M I N I. <laughs> there we go. Like mini driver. <laughs> okay. She's in a couple movies. Mini driver. She's in um, Phantom of the Opera. Phantom of the Opera. She's so funny in She's that. She's also in a movie called, I think, Return to Me. Return to Me. That's a good one. Yeah. That's one of Michael's favorite movies. Uh, mine too. I actually didn't see it until. Um, Michael and I were married. Never heard of it till really? then. Yeah, that's Gets a good me one. Right in the feels. You'll also notice here, and I'm trying to be more mindful when I create these outlines for you guys of where to put the lines. So what I've started to do is where there's a shadow, instead of outlining where the shadow is, I started putting these kind of like hash marks a little bit to remind you guys not to do like a really strong edge. Um, because that will affect how your painting looks to have like a really dark line in the middle of your painting. But I think it's helpful to know where we're going to put our darker values in. So uh, if you're wondering why we kind of have these thinner lines right here, they're not necessarily going to be like paint marks. It's more um, just saying here's a darker value here or here's the shadow. So you guys are free to um, include that or not. Another thing that you can do if you don't want to include like, like trace the hash marks is you can just keep the outline handy and just refer to it while you're painting to see where those hash marks are. Um, so then you know where to put in your shadows. But again, it's totally up to you. Also, there are times where you miss some markings. Absolutely. The first time you outline, so it's helpful to keep that around. I, um, I'm using an orange pen, which is kind of nice because then I can see where I've outlined and haven't outlined. Um, but sometimes you miss a spot, and I just want to remind you, outlines are not meant for you to copy something exactly. It's just a general guideline. So if you accidentally miss an area, no big deal, just eyeball it. And also, I don't want you to look at this as a coloring sheet. I want you to go a little bit outside the lines of what we're making here because we're blending, okay? Can they, does that show up okay on the? It's um, a little light, but I think it actually, I think it's, I think it's seeable, yes. They, okay, as long as it's, they can see it. It's not as dark as you usually go. I know, I was going a little soft-handed with that. Okay, so let's do our oath. If you can raise your right hand, you too, Erin, and you have to repeat after me. 
I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. Ding. Ding. <laughs> Um, and I love to start that way because I think when we're starting something, and especially when we're a little bit newer at it, we're feeling a little bit scared or insecure, and we're constantly kind of like looking over our shoulder like, am I going to measure up or is mine going to be as good? And um, that's not the point of creating. The point of creating is the joy in creating something, and it's not about who can do it perfectly or who can do it exactly. So I just want to remind you that... That's what we're here for is to have fun. So let's get started. Okay, I am going to grab my round six and we're gonna do our first step, which is kind of defining our, our shadows and our values. So I'm going to get my paintbrush wet, hit it off the side of my cup so it's not dripping, and I'm gonna mix a brown. Now brown is essentially dark orange but we don't have black here, um, but we can mix brown by mixing complementary colors. So I'm gonna grab a little bit of rose red and a little bit of green. And now I have kind of a brown, and this is, this is a really warm brown, but it's a good place to start. In watercolor, usually it's nicer to start with lighter values and build on those instead of start with the darkest darks because we usually don't have white paint with us. So we want to keep our lights as much as possible. So I'm going to start with this. If you're feeling like it's too orange, the opposite of orange on the color wheel is blue. So you can put blue on there a little bit to tone down the orange if you want to neutralize that color a little bit. Now, if your orange is really yellow and you add blue, it might now start looking green. If it starts looking green, add a little bit of red. So when I'm mixing colors, I just like to react to whatever color happens because it's not an exact formula and what you guys are mixing is gonna be different than how I'm mixing because it depends on how much paint you pick up. So um, just kind of be okay with yourself reacting to what's happening on here. And if you need a little color wheel to remind you what complementary colors are, you can find that anywhere. We also have it on our website. We also sell a like actual physical one too. We do. So I'm gonna add a little bit more green. Okay, so I now have kind of two browns going here. I have a darker brown and a lighter brown right here. And I'm gonna pull from the lighter brown to begin with. So I'm getting my round six wet, hitting it off the side of my cup, picking up some of this brown, and I'm gonna start putting shadows in. Specifically, I'm gonna work underneath the neck here, like underneath the chin, and underneath the hands or the paws. Yes. Okay. So putting it in, I'm working fairly quickly. And then immediately I'm gonna grab a little bit of water, rinse my brush, pick up a little bit more water, hit it off the side of my cup, and start to blend out. And you might be asking me like how far you should blend out. I usually don't go all of the way because I like to keep some white areas as I paint and leave those as highlights. So I usually, I'll probably just blend out, I don't know, what is that, half an inch maybe, a little bit less, but again, you can react to it. Then I'm gonna pick up some more brown and go underneath the paws. I'm calling them paws, do you think that's right? I'm actually Googling it. Great. Yeah. Very great. So yes, five webbed agile fingers on each paw for gripping and small prey. Oh, okay. So I didn't. I didn't know that sentence would get so aggressive. <laughs> so violent. Okay, so I have my brown, and immediately I'm going to grab some more water, hit it off the side of my cup so it's not too much water, and start to blend. 
Now the longer you let your shadow sit or this darker value sit before taking water and blending it out, the harder it will be to blend out. So that's why I try and work fairly quickly. Now, um, oh, I just read a tip. I don't know if it would work with watercolor, but I'm learning about gouache. Oh dear. And somebody said that they keep uh, like a spray bottle, like a really soft mister next to them um, because it keeps their painting wet as they're painting with gouache. And I thought, hey, that might work in watercolor. Um, I haven't tried it. Interesting. But yeah, if like you notice that you have a hard time working quickly where you can't keep your paper wet while you're painting, I wonder if you can like paint an area and then like kind of like spritz it. I think there's a hose nearby. We could probably try and... <laughs> There we go. <laughs> to actually, just put your hand in here and just flick it. Yeah. Don't do that. It would have to be a really soft mist, so it would be an even like spray. Because if sense. it's like drippy, then it would actually end up making marks. But I feel like if it's a soft, even mist, that would work. Be really fun to play with. Also, it's handy if you have the tube pa paints that you leave dried in your palette, because then you just spritz your palette and then that way your paints are wet and ready to go. Oh. We don't have to do that as much with the liquids, but if you have the tubes, that's really helpful. Hmm. Pro tip. Pro tip. Okay, so I started to establish my shadows and then I'm gonna keep going by starting to put in my fur shadows. Now I know that when it comes to painting textures and fur, our brain knows that they're individual hairs and so we want to paint individual hairs. Um, and some artists do. Some people are photorealist painters, which is amazing. Um, that's not really what I'm going for here. I'm kind of going more for the general idea of the texture. And so instead of like painstakingly painting every hair and doing that, um, I tend to notice where there are clumps of where those like fine hairs clump together. And I paint those shadows and highlights, which will then give you the same idea of the texture, which is fur that we're going for. And that same um, technique I use for when I'm painting trees or basically like hair, human hair, same kind of idea. So um, that is what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna grab my round six. I'm gonna pick up this darker brown and kind of where I have these little upside down V's or arrows is where I'm going to start putting in my uh, shadows. Kind of where this hair is gathered. Now again, you guys can deviate from the outline um, if you want to do an extra here or there. That's actually one thing I really like seeing you and Nicole both do, where you use an outline or you, like for Nicole, for example, she would with pencil write something and then she wouldn't always follow that specific line. Mm. She would go with as she wrote it because the, the pen versus the pencil is a little thicker. So same with this, you're going with the painting. And the other thing too is if, what I want you guys to pay attention to is the direction of these lines. Um, you'll notice that these little V shapes are not going all the same angle the same way and that is because they would change angle across the form. And so even when you're painting your brush strokes and the angles of what you're painting as informs the shape that you're painting. Since this is not a completely flat object and it has form, then you'll see that it kind of shifts and kind of like they start to go in, then they move, and then they kind of go this way. And that is to show that this is a rounded three-dimensional form. And just when we can give little tips like that to our viewers of like what's going on, it just kind of adds dimension to your painting. But I wanted to give you that tip for those who want to do a little extra um, little V's and furs. Also, I would like to say that at this point in your painting, when I made this project, Keenan, I'm not kidding, I painted this far and I thought, no. And I ripped it off the pad and I carried it to the trash and I was about to toss it in the trash, this exact one. And then I thought, you gotta give it a chance, Sarah. Like, follow your own advice, give it a chance before you make a decision on it. So what? I brought it back and finished it. Just so you know, your painting is gonna look way funky right now, okay? Don't give up on it. 
funny you say that because I was looking at it and I was like, this guy looks like he's got some winter weight he's just chilling with right now. <laughs> it's real like cozied up in a blanket. Well, even with, I think it was when I started doing like the fur textures and the shadows on this belly and stuff like that where I was just like, this is not communicating how I want it to. But then I remembered that like paintings are not always clear halfway through and you have to give them a chance before you make a decision on them. And I had to like, even though I tell you guys that fairly regularly, it was funny to like catch myself not following my own advice. And then I'm like, give it a chance, Sarah, before you throw it away. And it turned out great. I just had to um, sit with it a little bit longer. And then you'll see here, I kind of used the length of these little fur textures to give us an idea of how long the actual hair is. So like up on the forehead and the head, you'll see that they're kind of short and stubby and kind of more on this body. And then when they get to the rest of the body, they get a little bit longer. And I think when I was looking at my reference photo, um, that's what I noticed with the, um, the hairs is that they get a little, they got longer on like the bottom part of the body. So that's just another tip for you guys on how to, uh, when you're adding your little fur, fur textures. The other thing I wanna bring attention to is I am lifting up my brush. So I'm kind of blending these out, but I'm lifting up my brush as well because I want there to be highlights. In order for there to be form on something, you need to have a value range, which is dark values, medium values, and light values. Now in acrylic or oil or others, you have a white paint that you can work with that you put the highlights at the end. With watercolor, we use the white of the paper to actually be our, act as our highlights. So we have to leave some areas not painted in order for those highlights to actually show up and make our form pop. So I tend to leave a lot of white area while I'm painting because um, then I don't paint myself into a corner and not be able to put highlights in there. That was a pun, Keenan. That was a great pun. You I didn't smiled. laugh. I don't know. I was like, that was <laughs> inside I laughed. Inside, on the inside. I'm gonna put a little bit of color on the, um, on my paws as well too. Kind of leaving the edge of those mostly white so they have that kind of highlighted form on the edge. And the other fun thing that I like to do is I love strong hints of color. I think it adds visual interest to a painting. So sometimes if I'm feeling really edgy, I'll like take an orange or a bright yellow and just like drop it in. And then just like blend it out and see what that does. Well, that's nice. And you can play, you have the freedom to play with that. And again, this is where it all comes down to personal preference. There are some artists who prefer, prefer to mainly like use really more realistic colors to what you would see and work in more desaturated tones. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but for me, I, I kind of like the little pops of, of like red or green or yellow and I play with them and I, and I put them in different places. Um, so I'm just kind of giving you that permission to, to play with that if you want to. If not, you can stay with your browns. And there's, again, no problem with that. The only thing now that I'm looking at my reference photo that I would maybe say in off of that is I'm really colorful in this mid area and I've, I'm not as colorful in the other areas. So maybe while I'm painting this, I can say, hey, I did some kind of more bright yellow orange there. I might wanna bring it up into other areas of my painting. So then it kind of has the same feeling across the entire painting. So I'm gonna go through and add a little bit of yellow in orange kind of feel throughout here.
I never thought of this, but otters are carnivorous. Oh my gosh, yes. I know that because of um, Zootopia. Oh my gosh, yeah. that's right. Because they're small, so I never thought of that either. But then if yeah. you know that movie, the predators were turning and... Whoa, spoilers. <laughs> I feel like that was established like the wow. first second of the movie. I didn't give it away. And anyways, one of them was an otter. And I probably wouldn't have guessed that based on their size. But Okay, I'm going to leave this area alone and move on to something else. Sometimes when you're so much in one area, you start to get lost. And so when I'm starting to feel that, I'll move to somewhere else and then come back to it. So we're going to move on to our next step and we're going to work on our water. So I have water here, like right underneath the, the otter. And then I kind of did a ripple effect coming out because water moves. It also... I wasn't that perfect. <laughs> <laughs> But what I'm saying is, if you want your water, if you want it to seem like there's no movement at all, then you wouldn't have these ripples. If you want it to feel like there's a lot of movement, that's when you would have uh, ripples or waves. So it just depends on how active, I guess, you want your water to be. So I'm grabbing, you're such a stinker. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm grabbing some blue and I wanna make it a little bit darker. So I've grabbed a little bit of the rose red, which is going to give it kind of like a purple hint. And then I'm going to grab just a tiny bit of um, tiger orange, just a little, to give it almost like this green-blue color. Can they see that mixing on the... Yes. Okay. You can. Yeah, I was going to say, you can bring a little left if you need. So not only would the water right underneath the, right by the otter be a little bit of a darker value because the otter body is casting a shadow, simultaneously as well, you would actually see, depending on how clean the water is, you would see the otter's body a little bit underneath that surface as well. So that's why if you see here, I kind of have a little bit of brown going on over here because my hope is that it's showing you that the body continues underneath the water. It doesn't just stop right there. So I'm grabbing some color that I just mixed and I'm going right on this edge. And it doesn't have to be a super um, like hard line because the fur would make it a little bit uneven. And I'm gonna start with that section and then I'm just gonna grab water and blend. Oh, that's a good blue. That is a pretty color. That is so pretty. <laughs> and then I'm just going to keep adding water to this color to make my ripples. And again, you'll see that I'm picking up my brush. I'm leaving whites for my highlights on my water. And the reason why we want it to get, I like to have my paintings kind of fade um, and to get the lighter value in watercolor, you just add water. So instead of having to pick up white paint, I can just pick up some water and let that kind of fade out a little bit. Okay. So I'm going to get to the hand here. I'm going to put the blue in. And then I'm going to grab some of the brown and put it in right next to it. Now, you've got to be careful at this point because if you mix those too much, they'll turn green. So I'm going to kind of blend out. Do a little bit more of the brown down here. and grab some blue again. And it actually might be easier to switch to your two at this point since we're doing a finer line. So I'm gonna grab that blue. And I just wanna make sure it's a nice darker value. If I have to, if I want it darker, I'll just mix more color. So I have a slightly darker blue, there we go. It's getting that really nice dark edge.
I'm going to switch back to my round six. Start kind of blending this out. And again, this painting is a little bit more about giving general ideas of what is going on instead of having to paint everything in depth and detail. And that's a stylistic choice um, as you guys start to become more comfortable with creating your own paintings, you can make those decisions and you can decide which style you prefer and then you can make all the rules pretty much. If I was more comfortable in doing this project, I would make those ripples turn into a quilt to where he just like jumped into a quilt and it's just chilling. <laughs> that you would know? be cool. Would that be awesome? <laughs> yeah. He's like, hey there. <laughs> How are you? Is that what a... Have a picnic. Is that what an otter would say in a quilt? I think so. <laughs> hey there. <laughs> hey there. Now, okay, so for example, I just kind of blended out that line, right? And what happened was, is it went a little bit too, the angle isn't supporting the, the angles that I have going on with the ripples. So when that happens, don't stress, just take your brush and just like blend it out and like try and get that angle back on track. Mm. It's not the worst thing. I think the biggest thing when we mess up is sometimes we just get like so flustered that we mess up that we don't react like quickly where a lot of it in watercolor is like, no, it's okay. Take a deep breath. Um, if it's a light enough value, you can kind of like paint over it. If not, um, usually you can lift up color using water. I'm gonna like mix a little bit more blue into my mixture because it's reading fairly green. And then you'll notice that I'm not doing as much of a darker value on the top, on the like the other side of this otter, because the shadow of the otter is not on this side, it's on this side. So I want to be clear that like this is where his body is meeting on this side and that's why there's a darker value. And this is just a continuation of the water, the other side of him. And we've done different water textures before. I think in the, which one? We've done like splatter water too. Oh yeah. Do you remember that? There was, um, I think a Father's Day project last year. Oh, the fish. fish, the rainbow trout. Yeah. So if you guys wanna use that kind of splatter technique and water driplets, you can. If you wanna do an even wash across the whole thing, you're welcome to. Um, because again, this is your painting. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to follow exactly what I'm saying. Are you gonna name this otter? I absolutely think we should name our otter. Okay. I'll be thinking about it. I feel like when we do the face, that's really gonna totally. tell us what this otter is about. What kind of attitude he has. Yeah, exactly. Does he have a 401k? <laughs> Does he seem like the kind of guy that starts saving for retirement in his 20s? Exactly. I actually read an article yesterday that was like, start saving for retirement in your 20s. And I was like, oh, ooh, ooh. My retirement just got pushed. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm already about 10 years behind, <laughs> but that's okay. Okay, and I'm going to do one more swish or layer I guess swish one more layer right where that body is meeting that water I just want it to be a, a little bit darker I just want that really dark value in there so I mix a little bit of red into my blue mixture to give it a darker value and I'm just going to go along that edge with my round two and put that in there Now 
Because sometimes the technique that we use of putting our darker values in and then blending them out, sometimes we just blend out our dark values. Um, and so sometimes you have to go back and put them in and there's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure that your painting is dry. If you try and do it when everything is still wet, they'll just, it'll just blend out and even out across the water. And again, I'm trying to account for, for the fur textures, so I'm kind of like making some indents in there. Another thing that will change that I found out on my mini projects, M-I-N-I, is that if the paper is different from what you, this is, it will blend and dry differently. Yes. Because the paper I was using was something else. I think you were using the mini pads that came in this bonus. I think yes. you were using Stonehenge. So that will dry much differently than this Canson will. Yes. I, I have noticed over time that the liquid watercolors work better with the Canson paper. Whereas when I use, um, like when I switch any of those things out, like if I use liquid on um, the uh, like arches or Stonehenge Legion, um, they won't react quite the same. And I, and I don't want to say it, that it's bad because I don't think any of it is bad. I think it just depends on what you prefer to use. And I think it's silly to shame people for like what they want to use because it's personal preference. So, um, but I have noticed specifically that the pigment paints also on the canvas, so ones that come in um, tubes, on the Canson paper, they also don't blend out the same. So really pay attention to the supplies that you're using and if you're getting frustrated, it might just be the types of supplies that you're using and the combination of supplies, which is why I'm trying to give you guys samples of other things in these monthly subscription boxes so you guys can figure out what works for you. Because before, if you've never tried like the Legion paper, which is wonderful paper, um, and you use it and you're like, oh, this is wonderful. This is exactly what I've been wanting and missing. Then now you know what you need. And so, you know, you, yep. you don't know until you try it. So that's why I'm trying to give you guys different um, samples of stuff so you can figure out really what works for you and what you're looking for. Okay, I'm gonna leave the water alone and we're gonna go back to the head. So, um, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the shadows because I actually haven't really painted the head at all yet. So I'm gonna do the fur and the shadows on the head, and then I'll go back to the body while that dries, and then we'll do the eyes and the nose and the mouth. So I still have my brown mixture here, and the top of the head has a slightly darker value. So I'm gonna start with that, and then I'm gonna blend forward. And the reason why that is darker is because the head, again, is three-dimensional. It's moving away from the light and turning away from it. That's why usually, Things that have form, the edges are darker value depending on where the light source is. If the light source is in the front, then that form is turning away. That's why it's gonna be a darker value. Where like in the middle where that light is hitting it, that's where um, it's lightest value, as well as if anything is poking out. You know what I mean? That's why your nose is usually highlighted because it's poking out of your face and hitting the light different. I'm just gonna keep blending. Also, so otters don't have um, like a super defined snout, but it is still there. So we have to put a little bit of a shadow kind of underneath. That's what's going on over here to show that it is poking out from the face. Where if it was like, I mean, think of like a bird or whatever, like <laughs> <laughs> those things just go. <laughs> that would be really defined. Keenan, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so well placed. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. If anyone's confused, Sarah's referring to my nose looking like a bird's. Listen, <laughs> Keenan, should I explain? <laughs> I mean, it's a good story. Okay. Keenan, oh, 
You know when you feel like there's something about you that's so obvious, but it's not true at all? It's only because you're super hypercritical of yourself? Yeah. Keenan feels like he has a bird face, which is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. <laughs> So I tease him about it because there is nothing. I'm like, your nose is perfectly proportioned to your face. Like, what do you? I told one of our coworkers, Desiree, that she told everyone else that I look like a bird. But she did not. She did not. <laughs> Keenan makes fun of himself about it. Yes. Which is why I feel comfortable making fun of him about it. Yeah. But maybe I shouldn't do that. No, Keenan. I'm pretty comfortable with it. It's okay. Okay. Because it's funny. <laughs> Oh, 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 okay. So I went to my round two and it still had blue on it. So you can see I have a light blue wash there. Not the end of the world, but while it's still wet, I could just pick that up with a paper towel. Also at this point, if you're working in really light washes, if your water is super dirty, it's actually going to leave a color on your um, painting and paper. So again, you guys um, will know what's best, but if you need to switch out your water, there's nothing wrong with doing that. I use two cups with the hope of leaving one to clean and one to pick up clean water, like clean my brush and then I have clean water. I can't, I just rinse. Those are pretty much the same. Color. I can't do that. I try really hard. Like that's why I bring two water cups. Yeah. But Maybe I just. You should bring four. <laughs> Okay, just I'll bring try. Them. Next time we'll just have all of the cups. I'll just have the entire thing, water cups. Yes. I bet you I'll still rinse in like whatever yeah, one I see. That would be really fun actually to figure out. That would be fun. We'll try it. All right. Okay, anyways, back to painting. So I'm just kind of putting a little bit of darker value to show that 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 nose or snout or I don't know, I don't know what to call that, is poking out from the face. And you'll see here, this had a long time to dry. Well, one, because I was talking. And two, because I had to pick up that paint right away. So it didn't blend out as easy. If it's not blending out at easy, as easy, all you have to do is pick up a little bit more paint and put that in there, and then that will be a smoother transition. I have also heard some people say that depending on what the climate is like, where they are painting, that affects how easy they can blend stuff out on their um, painting. Hmm. Um, like. For really dry areas, they're saying that they're having a hard time blending right away. It doesn't transition as smooth. Um, so that's... Bless Excuse you. Me. I'm so sorry. That came out of nowhere. It did. It did. I'm sorry. Um, you can use that trick if you're having a hard time um, blending out if you're in a drier area. Instead of using just water when you blend, you pick up a little bit of paint and then blend out. Sorry, that sneeze really did come out of nowhere. That was shocking. <laughs> Surprising. Okay. There also is a little bit of a darker value kind of on the side of the eye here. I'm going to put that in and blend that out. And on my outline, you can see that I have that, those little hash marks right there. And I just grabbed a little bit of rose red to mix in with my brown because I felt like this was starting to feel a little bit green. So um, if, if you paint an area and do a light wash and you're like, gosh, that looks really green, you can just do a little bit of a soft like red wash over it and it will neutralize that green. Another thing I would like to point out too um, is sometimes when we're painting and we put down a color, like when I put down the yellow or the red or whatever, and it has undertones of a strong other color, sometimes that's all we can see. So then we kind of stress out and we're like, why is my 
bunny green or why is my otter yellow? But if you actually take a step back, the nice thing about our brains is that it assumes a lot of information for us. And so if you see that um, while you're painting this, you might be like, people aren't gonna tell what this is because this is feeling really yellow or really green. But if you step back from it and look at it from far away, a lot of people, when they're looking at a painting for the first time, don't really actually notice those um, strong colors underneath as much. So I would suggest to you to like not stress out as much um, and not feel like you're painting, like you have to like throw your painting away because it's not as obvious to someone who's just looking at it as to someone who's actually painting it. Does that make sense? Total makes sense. To okay. Total. Total makes sense. Make total, total make, <laughs> it's a video game, I think. It's just called Total, <laughs> Total Makes Sense. Okay. That actually makes me think of the sunset photo I took that you noticed the purples. Mm-hmm. And I did not see that color. I mainly yeah. just saw green. Keenan had this, he took this beautiful photo of the Hamilton with his drone. And really where that sun is hitting the landscape, like that top part, it was looking purple and it was so beautiful. Yeah, Actually, great. will you send that photo to Michael? Michael, yes. can you put that photo in right now so they could see? And I just said, I love right there that that area is purple. And Keenan was like, I did not Never notice that. Never seen that color. Where like if you were painting that and you had to pull out purple, you'd be like, what the heck is going on? But it's there. <laughs> okay, so I started on my face. I'm going to let that dry and then I'm gonna move on to the body um, a little bit more and then we'll come back and do the eyes. Actually, let me do the ear really quick. The ear is just this little edge of color here and then outlined on the other side. Blend out. Okay. Okay, so now that I put like one or two layers down across the body, now I can go in and kind of start uh, finessing it a little bit is what I call um, that. And that means like maybe putting in the more details, putting in darker values, that kind of stuff. So here like on the chest, I have smaller little dashes that kind of come out as the fur. And I go over fur textures in the beginner series if you're interested in how I do my marks for fur textures. But they're basically um, like little dashes that are kind of curved depending on how, like the direction the fur would be going. I would like to point out that when I do these, I do not make them all the same, like that. I do not do that. I let them vary in length. And I usually have them all come out from the same area. Or I'll do a different number. Okay? Okay. That looks more like tufts of fur, where this one you're like, I'm not entirely sure what's going on there. Okay. So I'm gonna start putting some of those in. And again, if your values on your otter are still quite not where you want them to be, you can do another layer. Your, inform, your painting will inform you as you go, and it's okay to react to it. And I know that's really scary as someone who's just learning, and I know that you probably want to hear exactly how many to do of what, but I feel like there's a lot of value in letting you guys be the ones making those decisions, um, because that's how you learn. If I just told you exactly what to do every single time and not really explain why or how to change it or whatever, then um, you wouldn't be able to go and do your own paintings probably for a long time. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm mixing more brown because I ran out of brown. There we go.
And then on the little paws, the little tufts get a little bit smaller again. And then the paws are going to have kind of indents here of where those webbed, what did fingers. it say? Webbed fingers go. So make sure to put those in too. Also, you'll see here on my reference photo and on this that there's a pretty defined area where it gets darker in value right here. And that is because, um, you know when you're halfway in the water and some parts of you stay dry and then some parts of you got wet, but then it came back out? That's kind of what happened here. So like, it's like this half of him yep. is outside totally and this half of him is going in and out of the water, which is why it's a little bit darker value. It's sense. either darker value because it's wet or it's a darker value because the water is actually over it. So that's kind of why that's going on right here. And that is so much lighter up here as opposed to like the belly and so near the end. So maybe he's just rolling through the water, doing barrel rolls. <laughs> and that part's still wet, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yes, came in. I feel like that's not that strange. No, I, I just... I like to do barrel rolls in the water. Oh, I'm laughing. If I could do a barrel roll as an otter, I would. I guess I'm laughing more at, um, well, I work with Keenan, you guys. I'm getting to know him fairly well. And I love that when he gets excited about idea, he just like keeps it going. And you just, you just create this narrative about this thing. And I just, I'm, it's in everything and it's really wonderful. And it just makes me laugh every time. It's like, yeah, cause your otter is doing barrel rolls over and over in a quilt, having a picnic. You're right. Uh, it just makes me chuckle. Okay, and then, and you can, at this point, you can still use your paintbrush to blend out some areas because sometimes if we only focus on doing this part, it starts to feel a little disjointed. So I purposely like to go in and kind of mess up some of these areas. Again, I'm not doing an even wash. I'm still lifting up my brush for highlights. But I think that there's value in just like being a little bit messy, blending stuff out. And here, almost on this side, I've totally like let the color disappear. So I need to bring some back in. Blend. There we go. And let's do some yellow yellow, orange, red, like we did in the shadows there. Ooh, I like that. That looks nice. I like that. <laughs> Maybe bring that up here. And again, these color choices, the vibrancy, how much it's being used, it's all up to you. I just think that orange plays so well against this blue, and I think that's why I'm oh, loving it. Why. They're uh, complementary colors. So. <laughs> they are. Nailed it. Nailed it. Okay, now I'm going to switch to my two and do a little bit more fur up this way. And on the paws. Okay. Okay. The other thing that I want you guys to pay attention to, and I'm kind of catching it in myself right now, and I know that I say this a lot, but I have to keep saying it, mostly as a reminder to myself, but also to you guys. Our brains like to make patterns even when we don't pay attention to it. And if I'm looking at my fur line, especially right here, I'm noticing that my fur patches are all very similarly shaped and evenly spaced. 
and your brain is just automatically going to do that to you. You kind of have to fight it. And so like going in here, I'm like, okay, I need to make some that are a little bit shorter and maybe throw off the spacing a little bit because these are all feeling too much the same. And sometimes when things are too evenly spaced and same exact across an area, it will flatten that area is what I've noticed. So kind of like be, uh, have a critical eye as you're painting this a little bit to see if uh, you notice that your brain is doing that. So I'm just gonna kind of connect some of these areas to throw off that pattern and spacing a little bit. There we go. And this needs a darker value over here. Okay, I'm gonna leave that. And let's go to the face where I'm gonna do the eyes and the nose and the mouth. Now we do not have black, um, which is okay. Because um, the interesting thing about values is it's not necessarily about the color you're using, it's about the value range. And so I'm gonna make like a really dark purple and because that's gonna be a dark value compared to everything else, it's almost gonna read as black. So I have my blue mixture, I'm gonna add a little bit more rose red to it. And in the eyeball, are we on the close up? We're on the close up. Okay. I'm using my round two, and I'm taking my black, not my black, my dark purple that I mixed. And I'm gonna do the eye. And I leave a highlight in there near the top and I'll go back and blend that out just not yet okay also if you have a really hard time um, working small if you use like a black marker or a pen for this little tiny areas it's not the end of the world like you you guys can do that I think I did that on one of the paintings mm -hmm. Do you remember which one I did that with, Keenan? I can't. No, I do not. I think it's when we had a micron pen in the yeah, box. Yeah, I do remember it was the a duck. micron pen. It was a duck. <laughs> what? I don't remember a duck. You don't remember us doing the white duck in April with the carrots as one of the projects and there was a duck? No, I do not. That is hurtful. I'm really sorry. It's fine. I'll go watch it. You're definitely not going to get paid. Okay. <laughs> That sounded so mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, you guys can absolutely do that. Another trick that you can do is if you're using, if you're able to control the amount of water that you're using fairly well, um, I've noticed that with liquid watercolors, if I get the area damp, like wet first, and then I drop in the color, the color tends to stay darker than if I were to just paint the dark color on it. Um, it's harder to do that in really tiny areas, but like if you watch the Monarch Butterfly tutorial, that's what I do on one of the wings is I paint the water first and then drop in the black and it stays darker than when I just paint the black on there. I don't know the science behind it. I wish I did, but that's another thing that I've noticed. So if you want your things to stay inky black, there's little um, tricks that you can use to help that. Okay. And I'm going to use that same black for the actual nostrils here. And then his nose kind of goes in, so it kind of goes out and then in, so that's why this is a little bit darker here. And I have a little bit of a mouth. And honestly, what gives like people or animals expressions and personalities is kind of the angle of how all of these things are painted. <laughs> so you'll see different personalities emerge as you're painting. Because <laughs> like the direction, the angle of your eye is an expression, you know what I mean? Or like 
for humans, it's the brow. The brow is really like, sorry, Expressive. I see Keenan like doing. <laughs> but that same thing is true for whatever you're painting that has a face. So you might start to see, I notice that sometimes people in the group are like, my, my thing looks really relaxed or, you know, my unicorn looks angry or something. And it's all about the, the angles of things as we paint them, specifically the eyes and the nose and the mouth. Okay. So I put those in and then I'm just gonna do a, just one quick swoop over the glare of this eye because we like glares, but sometimes if they're too white and too bright, then they actually become distracting. So I still want a highlight there, but it doesn't have to be as white as the paper. So sometimes I'll just do a quick swoop over an area um, to make it a slightly darker value, but not too bright. And I'm gonna put a little eyelid in here on the bottom, so just a little curve. And then on the front of that eye, it's gonna have a little bit of a shadow here. There's a little bit of shadow on the side of the nose here to kind of show that it's going almost to a point. That's why the side of this is more shadowed here. And I'm gonna add a little bit of yellow red on the face somewhere because I have it here. I have it really strong in the body. I don't have it as much on the face and I want it to feel as one. So I'm just gonna go in. It's easier to do it on parts where there's like shadow than a highlight maybe. And just add a little hint of that color here and there so then this painting feels as if it belongs all in the same world. Okay, we're getting close, you guys. You're doing awesome. Sarah, do you think you could put the reference photo more towards the middle? Yes, like here. Here? Middle meaning right above the pad of paper. Oh, pad of paper. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Now we want to let that dry and make sure it's dry before we start doing the little fuzzy detail hairs on the face. And the reason why we want to let that dry is because if an area is wet and you put um, paint in it, it will just bleed and blend out. If you want to keep something sharp, you got to make sure that it is dry. So I just touch my painting to see if it's dry. There might be a better way. That's what I do. Hmm. Okay, and that feels fairly dry. And even if like, let's say it's not dry and you, and you go it in and put it in and it just fuzzes out, don't stress. For me, I just leave that and then wait a few more minutes and then I'll do my fuzzy um, little fur texture. So I'm going to go in and do some little dashes that kind of gather into the nose. We're trying to show that this, the shape of the head is kind of like pointing towards the nose, right? So that's why the angles of these hairs are changing. Again, try and pay attention to the spacing on some of them so it's not too uh, even. And then it also, I mean, the whole, entire face is fur. So if you want to do a little bit of like smaller fur textures on the side, I think their entire face is fur. Oh, yeah. Sure, okay. Sure. <laughs> I just said that and then I'm like, is that right? It feels right. And 
then again, sometimes I like to blend some of them out. Sometimes I like to keep them sharp. This is your, your choice here. Yeah, they're full fur face. <laughs> full fur, fur, full? Full fur face. Can you say that five times fast? Full fur face, full fur face, full fur face, full fur face, full fur face. That was good. Thank you. That's impressive. I had to concentrate really hard. My eyes went, my eyes went cross eyed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That feels better. I'm going to redefine his ear and then we're going to go in and we're going to put in the whiskers. Now, for the whiskers, I just want to say whiskers are hard. They're really, really hard. So if you have a hard time getting a really nice thin line, I'll leave the whiskers up to you because um, it's hard getting a really fine thin line with the paintbrush. Um, again, you can use a pen if you want. You can leave them out. Um, but I, it is kind of heartbreaking when you paint this thing and you love it and then your whiskers are really, really thick, you know? And then yeah. you're like, gosh darn. More like a mustache rather than a whisker. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you can also practice, and I go over this in the beginner series, but since we have to wait for it to dry. When I do whiskers, I pick up paint. I'm gonna do a vertical hold, so it's nice and light pressure. And I actually try and do it pretty quickly, because I've noticed that if I try and do it nice and slow, it ends up being a thicker line and it gets kind of shaky, okay? So you have to like, it's scary because you have to have this like wham bam confidence, but you guys can do it. And you just kind of like go, 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 go. And I'm kind of letting my brush lift up Right there. Then do that again. Same okay. thing. Run it again. Run it again. So if you need to exaggerate this a little bit, you can where it's like, um, like I'm going to like pull away. So I'm lifting. You might not need to exaggerate it as much, but it's a nice reminder. Also, when you're doing long thin lines, you might get like, um, where you'll, you'll, you'll see on this one how it's an unfinished line right there. That's okay. I leave those. I do not try to go in and make that line even because it is super hard to match the actual thickness of that line and the angle. And I think it would actually distract more from it if I tried to finish this than if I were to leave it. Also with really thin lines, you don't see them all the time. It really depends on how the light hits it. Think of like a spider web. Spider webs, you don't see every single line. It's more you see where the light is hitting that. So mm. if there are unfinished lines, there's nothing wrong with that. Nice. So don't stress over those. Another trick that I do when I do thin lines is when I pick up paint, I sandwich my paintbrush on my palette. So I press down on one side and I press down on the other. And that way I know that I have a nice smushed kind of thin line there. Do you spin it when you do that? I don't spin it. I just do one side, flip it over, do the other side. Because I want it to flatten. Mm -hmm. And then I play off of that flat angle. Okay? So, and just so you guys know, I get nervous every time I do whiskers too because you just got to go for it. But, so I got my, I'm going to use that same kind of dark blue purple color. I have it sandwiched. And if you need to like turn your paper to get the angle right, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and you're just, you're just going to go for it and it's going to be okay. Cause we're going to remind ourselves that it's just a piece of paper. And the worst thing that can happen is we throw it away and that's the worst. So, well, I need a little bit more paint. You've, uh, you've rotated drastically. <laughs> Sorry. Where does it need to be? And I'll I make sure it's I just got really there. confused. I was like, why is the otter upside down? <laughs> I 
And you'll notice as you guys paint thin lines that it's sometimes easier for you to do like either up and down or across. I'm a, a cross person, so that's why I um, am doing that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's totally yeah, Okay. Absolutely. And here we go. I'm going to squish it one more time because that got a little thick, but that's okay. There we go. There. And then this side always throws me because it's like going to the left when I like to go to the right. But that's okay. We can do hard things. And I'm just going to have it. And you want to make sure that they kind of round. See how they're kind of at an angle instead of just straight? So make sure you kind of curve the, your whiskers. And you're just going to... I need a little bit darker and thicker here. There we go. Let's do one more. One more dark, thick one. There we go. There we go. That feels better. Okay. 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 Yeah. I think we're good. Um, again, I highly recommend you guys um, taking a step back from your painting and then coming back to it, back to it, looking at it far away because when you're far away, it's easier to see things like value, shape, color, things like that. Um, somebody actually sent me this message, which was really helpful um, because when I'm when I'm painting these tutorials, I'm in it like this, so it's hard for me to see and step back. Um, she says that she keeps a mirror at her desk and looks at it through the mirror and it does that same thing of what? stepping back from it. Which I thought was really an interesting That's tip. That's super cool. I haven't tried it, but you might want to try it. So, also taking a picture is also helpful because it flattens it for you. Um, so, you can use all of those things to um, take a look at it. Because when you're in it, usually you're like so far like in the in the weeds that you can't see the entire thing in the entire effect so always take a step back from your painting before you make a decision on it um, I cannot wait to see how your painting turns out we did a lot of color mixing and things like that so everybody's is gonna look different um, you can tag us on Instagram at let's go make art or hashtag let's make art we also have a Facebook group which is for the sole purpose of you guys just sharing your art and seeing how um, we all kind of make things our own and take a minute to learn from each other. It doesn't matter your skill level. We have a lot. I think that group is like 50,000. It's large. It's large. So there's lots of skill levels involved. So don't go in there thinking that um, you can only share if it's perfect because that's not the point. We get the idea that art um, is something that you're born with or you're not because usually people only share things when they feel like they're really good and after years and years and years of practice and that perpetuates that idea that it's something you're born with or you're not which is not true it's just a skill like any other thing that the more you do it the better you will be and we can get rid of that idea by sharing things that aren't perfect and putting ourselves out there more and that is scary um, but it's super beneficial and when you're courageous, it gives other people permission to be courageous, and um, I know you guys can do it. So you can join that if you want to see what other people are making and you want to share your art. If you need any of these supplies, you can find them at letsmakeart.com, and I think that's all i got to say. Yes, Keenan? We didn't name the otter. Ooh, what I'm, do you think? I'm thinking Charlie. Mmm, that's a good one. It's a good name, Charlie the Aaron, otter. how do you feel about Charlie? Uh, Charlie has my blessing. Charlie yes, has your blessing. Yeah, you. <laughs> so this is Charlie, our otter. I would love to see what you name yours. Thank you for reminding me, Keenan. You're welcome. Um, you guys are awesome. Thanks for painting with me, and I'll see you next week. Bye.